Hi there, it's Lisa Williamson here and welcome to Rules of Feeding, which is part of the BC Lower Mainland Pony Club Education Series. This is uh, the third in the series in the nutrition section. So we are going to be looking at Rules of Feeding, which is basically based on the British Pony Club Manual of Horsemanship Rules of Feeding. And the rules of feeding, as you probably know, are feed little and often. That is rule number one. Uh, feed plenty of bulk food. Feed according to size, age, breed, temperament, condition, season, and work done. Feed at regular times. Feed only clean, good quality forage. Uh, use clean, fresh water at all times, and it must be available at all times. Don't ride your horse immediately after feeding it. Introduce any changes to feeding gradually, and then finally feed a succulent every day. So we'll talk a little bit more about these as we go. So why do we need to feed little and often? Well, the biggest thing is that this is the closest to nature. Uh, basically, the horse has a very small stomach. If you are comparing it to other far farm animals, the horse has the second smallest stomach of any farm animal. Uh, food only stays in the stomach about 15 to 20 minutes as well. So it's going to get passed through very quickly. If you overfill the stomach, then the horse will not get the advantage of that. By the time digesta, or the food that the horse intakes, has reached the stomach, it has actually doubled in volume. So if you are uh, can picture a bucket of food, a bucket of grain, once it gets into the stomach, it would be twice that amount, basically because of all the gastric juices that are added. So if you overfill the stomach, that will lead to the risk of gastric ulcers. Think back to equine uh, anatomy, the digestive anatomy, and the top third of the stomach is not coated uh, with a protective layer of mucus, and so therefore it's going to be any food that can touch that part of the stomach on the top, because if it's overfilled, then it will be at risk of getting gastric ulcers. Digesta stays in the stomach, as I said, approximately 20 minutes. So if the volume of feed given is too large, it's going to be pushed through the stomach into the small intestine before being adequately broken down. Therefore, the horse will not be able to digest it, and you'll probably see um, whole grains and other things in the manure as it comes out. It's going to pass right through the horse without getting broken down and digested. Big infrequent feedings can result in gastric impaction, so that is a, a type of colic. Um, horses should not be left without feed for more than eight hours. Big grain meals disrupt body chemistry. Uh, by that, I mean that the blood glucose and insulin levels in the horse will rise if you give your horse too much food. And at the same time, free fatty acids will drop. And this will lead to underfueling typically about three hours after you feed the horse. So if you think about the average person, you would feed the horse first thing in the morning. You take it out and you ride it, especially if you're at a show. And that could be if you're feeding your horse for energy, when your horse actually has the least amount of energy if you're feeding one big feed of grain uh, early in the morning. So we need to break up the amount that we feed the horses. One way to make sure that your horse is eating little and often is try and get them access to pasture because that will just make sure that they are eating constantly. Um, the horse in a natural situation would be grazing 14 to 16 hours a day. And so if you could put a horse into a field, they won't be getting the amount of movement because typically they would be moving over a large range of area, but they will be able to eat. Um, as much as their, their, their digestive system needs. Grass has also got a higher moisture content, which will end up helping to protect them against colic to a degree as well. Um, there's a broader range of plant species in grasses, and so that is good for them nutritionally. Um, they do get some exercise, more than a horse in a paddock or stall situation. Um, that makes their not just their hard tissues, but their soft tissues fitter and will hopefully encourage them to stay sound for longer. Horses at grass also have lower respiratory rates than horses or respiratory illness rates than horses in a stable and they also have lower rates of digestive disturbances, colic in particular. One thing a horse at grass will have a tendency to 
get more of it in a negative way is obviously laminitis. So you do have to protect against that if you have your horse out on pasture, especially in the springtime. Which leads us to the uh, next thing, which is feed according to work done. You also need to feed according to other things like how big your horse is, the temperament of the horse, the season or time of year, the age of your horse, and then the condition of the horse as far as whether it is fit or unfit, but also whether it is healthy or unhealthy. So feeding your horse will prevent your horse from, or feeding your horse according to the work done will prevent your horse from getting too much weight. So you have to think about calories in versus calories out. How much work is your horse actually doing? Um, and then feed according to that. If you overfeed your horse, you can end up Aside from getting a horse that is too fat, that can encourage a horse to develop or make a horse susceptible to metabolic syndrome, Cushing's laminitis. You can also have a horse that ties up if you ride it irregularly as well. There's many problems associated with horses that are fed too much. Um, as work increases, you have to increase food to provide the energy and increase the muscle mass. Um, if you decrease work, then you must decrease the food. Uh, Underfeeding is also just as bad as overfeeding, aside from the fact that it is cruel and unethical and you could get in trouble with groups such as the SPCA, which is obviously an extreme. You don't want to get to that point. There's going to be problems with performance. Your horse won't have the energy. If you've got a young growing horse, then that will be compromised. The immune system of the horse will be compromised as well. A horse that is underfed and you're riding it will be more susceptible to things like girth galls and other forms of rubs from saddles, tack, blankets, etc. because it doesn't have the protective coating of the fat. Um, so lack of forage feeds will make a horse more susceptible to health problems in the winter um, because they they end up actually fueling their body. Their body creates heat and so your horse will actually be, get colder in the winter if it doesn't have enough food. If your horse has vitamins and mineral deficiencies caused by underfeeding, then this can cause hoof problems, skin problems, and other associated health problems, immune system issues, etc., fertility problems. And then it's also just cost inefficient to underfeed horses because eventually you're going to have to try and put that weight back on the horse and so you'll have to feed them more. It's all going to come out at the end. So you also, with ponies in particular, feed according to size or feed according to breed. Ponies are just genetically set up to not require as much food typically as, for instance, a hot-blooded horse comparatively. And so you have to make sure that you don't overfeed ponies. Uh, you also have to watch with ponies that are on grass if you try and limit the amount of grass they're on. So rather than having them on grass all day, give them four hours of grass, they will actually increase their chew rate. They will chew faster and eat more constantly. So be aware of that. Limit grazing often does not work very effectively with ponies. If a pony has a weight problem, it is better to put them in a paddock and do controlled feeding of hay rather than try and limit grazing in a field. In the winter time, horses can burn up to 24% more carbohydrates and fats, and so you will have to feed the horse more hay in particular. Um, the hay will actually cause the horse to heat up because the horse will be digesting the um, hay in the cecum, and so the cecum actually works as a bit of a furnace for the horse. You may need to have specialized diets for horses that are young and growing. Mares, particularly in the last month of digestion, gestation rather, um, and then also lactating mares. Lactating mares are the category of horse that actually requires the biggest intake of nutrition. Horses doing intense work, and by intense work that might be advanced level of venting, resources, etc. Uh, your average pony club horse would not be considered to be in intense work. Breeding stallions require a lot of extra food, and then old horses will possibly require a specialized diet. Old is anything 20 to 25 years and above. Quite often this is complicated by dentition or teeth problems, um, but it is known that the small intestine starts to lose its ability to digest and absorb protein as the horse gets older, and so you will have to compensate for that. 
Horses that tend to be nervous or horses that are bullied by their stable mates may require a different sort of feeding program. Any horse that is recovering from illness, horses that have a heavy worm load or are recovering from having had a heavy worm load, horses with teeth problems will all need to be fed differently. And then horses with stable vices, they are just going to be self-exercising to an extreme um, and so will need more nutrition. In the winter time, every 10 degree drop in temperature requires a two pound increase in feed. Horses typically will acclimatize to temperature changes within about two weeks, but it does take about two weeks before they acclimatize to that. Okay, another rule of feeding is provide plenty of clean water at all times. This is important, especially any pony club member doing a C2 level. This is where water is one of the big questions that you'll be asked about in the nutrition section. But water is a major constituent of the body. So 80% of a foal's body and between 60 and 70% of a mature horse's body is comprised of water. And water is necessary for many things, in particular digestion, excretion, circulation, thermal regulation, but other things as well. It's present in the joints, uh, it's present in the eyes, it's present and uh, needed for hearing, there's so many things. A 20% water loss can be fatal to a mature horse. So make sure your horse has water at all times. Uh, horses typically drink between 27 to 54 liters of water daily, but in hot weather they'll require even more. Uh, horses that drink less in extreme cold weather are more susceptible to impaction colic. So make sure that your horse has access to water in cold weather. You need to make sure you feed a succulent every day. Uh, every horse likes a treat. Succulents provide variety in the diet, especially for horses that get bored with what they eat. Uh, it will stimulate the appetite. Succulents typically have a higher moisture content, succulents being things like apples and carrots, etc. So a higher moisture content than grains and hays. So that is good. It will help to keep things moving through the digestive system. Succulents can provide a broader range of essential nutrients, especially vitamins. And this is important for horses that are in the stable all the time. Another rule is feed plenty of bulk food. Bulk food stimulates peristalsis. Peristalsis is the muscular contractions that you will see in the intestinal tract and this is very important to prevent colic. If peristalsis slows down then that's when you can get impaction colics. The diet should be at least two-thirds bulk food. Never drop below a 50% bulk food to grain ratio. But the only horse that should be in this area, 50% bulk food to grain, would be a horse in a high level of work, such as an advanced level event horse or a race horse. Your typical horse that you're going to be working with would not be in that ratio, should not be in that ratio. You should always be feeding more bulk food, more haze and grasses in comparison to grains. The presence of bulk food in the system helps to reduce the incidence of twisted intestine as well. And bulk food helps to maintain low blood or helps to maintain blood sugar levels. Um, because bulk food requires more chewing, uh, this stimulates more digestive juices. This makes digestive di digestion more efficient, so the digesta will move through the system better. So there's a positive correlation between a high bulk diet and lowered levels of chewing related stable vices as well. Uh, synthesis of vitamin B in the cecum only occurs when the horse has fiber in its diet. So your horse is deficient in the amount of bulk food, they could be, develop a deficiency in a B vitamin. Also occurring in the cecum is production of byproducts of gas and heat. We talked about heat, that helps to keep your horse warm in the winter, but gas is important because it helps to move things through your horse's system. Our gas actually moves, is moved through the system by the presence of fiber, and so this will help to reduce gas colics in your horse. So fiber will move the gas along and move it out. So feed only good quality forage. That seems pretty much common sense, but if you do not feed good quality forage, Forage, you can end up with poor performance, uh, digestive disturbances, and respiratory problems such as heaves or COPD can be caused by dusty or moldy hay. Moldy hay can also destroy vitamin K in a horse's body and that will create a deficiency in vitamin K. If you are wetting down moldy hay, often people will wet hay down to get rid of dust. Um, 
They will wet hay down to get rid of sugars. If you wet hay down that is moldy, the spores can actually adhere more easily to the hay. The horse will ingest them or eat them, and then this can cause damage to the liver. So make sure you are not feeding moldy hay to your horse. Any feedstuffs, whether it's grain or hay, that is contaminated by vermin can be harmful both to horses and to humans. Possums and, and other creatures can cause EPM in horses. That's not so common here in the West, but certainly on the East Coast and in the central regions, EPM is a concern. Botulism toxin uh, is sometimes found in silage or haylage, such as round bales, and that will be highly fatal to horses. The amount that a mouse can survive of botulism will kill a horse, so horses are extremely susceptible to botulism. Moldy corn can contain a flavotoxin, and uh, toxins produced by aspergilli or other things cause degeneration of the liver and or the brain. Vitamin E can be destroyed by toxins in rancid feeds or oils. So especially in the summertime, make sure that any uh, oils that you're feeding the horse have not gone rancid uh, because that can cause a vit vitamin E deficiency. If you feed moldy feed, it will tie up biotin, biotin being one of the B vitamin complex. And biotin is necessary for metabolism. Uh, even good quality feeds, if you feed them wet, can end up fermenting, which will produce gas, and gas again can cause colic. Uh, cereal grains and oil seed meals or feeds that are finely ground can also ferment, causing gas colic as well. Okay, another rule is make no sudden changes in food or routine. So it takes up to six days for the bacteria in the hindgut to adjust to new feeds. So problems that can arise from this are things like diarrhea, uh, colic, in particular impaction colics, uh, ulcers, uh, other stress-related problems, and then just loss of appetite in general. Your horse might not want to eat, um, and that can be a huge problem. You should not work your horse immediately following a full feed. So this is another rule. Uh, horses cannot digest food during high intensity work. So if your horse is at rest, 90% of its circulation is devoted to the digestive process. But as soon as you start working your horse, then 90% of your circula of circulation is devoted to its muscles and keeping the horse moving. And only 10% will be dealing with digestion. So again, that means that Food will get pushed through, um, it won't be digested, the horse will not get the benefit from it. You need to plan pre-competitive grain meals so that the horse will have complete anabolic response before starting work. So this should be eight hours before the work. A high starch meal can cause a horse to be under fueled three hours after eating. So if you feed your horse breakfast at seven in the morning and then you're riding him at 10 in the morning in a horse show, that's going to be his lowest fuel time. So if you're giving high grain meals, high starch meals, you have to plan them differently. If you're doing high performance feeding, again, upper level event horses or race horses, anything that is a speed type sport, you can restrict the hay intake to 1% of the body weight for up to 36 hours before the event. This is going to reduce your horse's weight. Um, it's going to reduce the horse's lactic acid production. It will also help to open up space for the heart and lungs. If you have too much hay in the horse's system, it could interfere with the locomotor respiratory coupling that the horse needs in order to breathe properly when they are, when they are working. Okay, feeding your horse and working it. The biggest things that you have to think about when feeding your horse and working at the same time are things like gut fill, low plasma volume, and then high heart rate. If your horse has a high heart rate because you fed it too much just before you work it, uh, what's going to happen is fluid gets pulled from circulation to serve digestion. As we said, 90% of their circulation should be out working on the muscles and only 10% will be working on digestion. But if you disrupt that by feeding your horse, then you're going to cause the plasma volume to drop by 25%. So this could result in dehydration, uh, which in turn, it's, you've got a cascade of events happening here that will cause protein levels to go up. That will make your horse thirsty. Uh, this causes or affects your horse's ability to dissipate heat effectively. And the end result will be an elevated heart rate, which, again, is going to be inefficient for the horse at work. So thank you very much for listening. This was number three in the 
equine nutrition series and here are some questions for you to just try and follow up with. Okay, thanks. I'm Lisa Williamson.